This is my sheet mug. And that one right there, that guy right there with the black face, that is Suffolk, which is one of the down breeds that I am um, discussing this week. Right here, I'm not lit. Damn it. Okay, where's my phone? I'm probably gonna run out of battery. How's that? Is that better? I'm fine here, but I'm not getting any light. I'm not getting any light right here. There's just no light. Yeah, shadows. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I'm um, I'm channeling my my 70s vibe here with a pattern shirt. I'm always usually a, uh, a solid color girl. And... All right, let's do or die. Yeah, kind of just move. I have to just kind of scoot over here. Yeah, and I think I just raise it up a little bit and we'll be in good shape to go here. Yeah, and it's pretty good. How's that? Well, it's not perfect, friends. Uh, my The light is terrible today. It's a gray day here in Chicago. It's the 13th of January, 2023. And yeah, I'm in shadow, but you know, whatever. Charoscura, right? <laughs> All right, I'm gonna test this to see if it's working, and then we'll get the show on the road here. Hello, friends, welcome to my channel, Soulful Spinning. My name is Lisa, and I'm coming to you from the suburbs of Chicago in the US. Uh, welcome to my channel. This is my channel, Soulful Spinning, where I share my creative journey, mainly with fiber arts. So welcome to all new viewers and welcome back to returning viewers if you've stopped by before. Thank you for uh, checking me out today. So I thought I'd just do a little bit of introduction here for a lot of my new subscribers. I have almost 9,200 subscribers, I think. So I have a fair number of new, uh, new people who have uh, subscribed to the channel. So I just thought I'd give you a little uh, quick, quick background on who I am and uh, what I'm doing here. <laughs> so the name of the channel, Soulful Spinning, I came up with that name because for me, making, uh, knitting and spinning in particular is a very soul nourishing activity. It's uh, part of my meditation. It's part of my daily ritual. And I feel that it feeds the soul. So for me, you know, part, part of how I view the soul is that, that essence of my humanity. And that essence of my humanity, my core, is reflected in the things that I do and that I make. And so when I spin and when I knit, I, do, I feel that it's nourishing that core essence of who I am. And maybe you feel the same way about your knitting. I know many, many people say that knitting is their meditation or their yoga. So that's where the Soulful Spinning uh, name came from. And my name is Lisa. I'm a retired uh, math teacher. I uh, just retired last May in 2022. So this is my first school year without the ritual of school. And it's uh, quite an adjustment. Um, yeah, I'm just still trying to get my bearings here with, with managing my time and you know what, what it is that I want to do with the, the years that I have left. So in today's episode, I'm going to give you an update on my winter breed study. So if this is the first time you've been here, I uh, purchased a box of uh, 12 fibers from Hearthside Fibers on Etsy, and they're 25 gram samples of different breeds from around the world. And what I'm doing is every week, I'm spindle spinning the sample and knitting a square. I'm just finishing up my down breeds. I made this little, it's kind of a messy uh, concept map here, but this is the, the down family. So the down family was named for sheep that originated in a specific region uh, in the UK, the so southern part of England in the dunes or the downs of England, the hills of England. And during the I think it was during the mainly during the 19th century. So the big daddy of all the downs is the South Down, which is the grand ancestor of all the other down breeds, which 
nerdy tip here, uh, Jane Austen, who wrote all of her novels at Chawton Cottage, is in Hampshire, which is part of that Downs area. And I read somewhere that uh, her father most likely actually raised South Down sheep. So, yeah, I'm just imagining Jane, you know, wandering the, the surrounding woodlands of her area in the hills and seeing these sheep everywhere. So I thought that was a cool historical connection. I'm a huge Jane Austen fan. So yeah, so other members of this family are the Suffolk, uh, Shropshire, which is the one that I worked with, uh, Dorset Down, um, Hampshire, and Oxford. So I found out that the Suffolk and the Hampshire breeds were the dominant breeds in the U.S., and I think they still are today. Uh, they're mainly focused on meat production and club lambs. I guess they give like 4-H kids uh, little, these type of sheep. I guess they're very easy to handle. They're docile to raise in their 4-H projects. I, I don't know a whole lot about that. But the largest producers here in the U.S. sell their uh, clip to the industrial mills through wool pools. So if you go to like a big box store and you buy a wool yarn, most likely you're going to have some of these down breeds uh, in there, which I didn't really know that. I didn't know that that was the dominant breed in the U.S. in terms of commercial wool production. So the Shropshire in particular, and I hope I'm saying that right, uh, so forgive me if my pronunciations are, are lacking here. Me being a Midwestern American woman, I probably don't say things the proper way. But I found out a few things about Shropshire. And then hopefully while I'm, I'm giving you some information, I'll be inserting some pictures of them, of the animals. So the Shropshire is a conservation breed. It originated in a county in southwest England on the border with Wales which I just came back from Wales when, uh, when I did uh, Hill Radnor and Black Welsh Mountain the last couple of weeks. In 1853, they were recognized as a breed. Uh, they were imported in North America in 1855 and became the most common breed in North America by 1930. Though uh, my literature told me that they're not as common as they once were, you know, maybe that particular Shropshire breed. They're long lived. Uh, they often have twins and triplets. Um, the, the, they're good mothers, they, they are easy to raise, and they're pretty docile. They're often, it's often overlooked by hand spinners because they are basically a meat breed, the down breeds, but um, in my experience, I've really enjoyed spinning the down breeds, and I, th I think that they would be very good for a lot of purposes. This is some information I gleaned from the Spinner's Book of Fleece, which is this book right here. This is Beth Smith's book on uh, preparing different kinds of fiber. And then there's also an excellent uh, website that I found. It's the, it's the Shropshire Breed Block Book Society, which according to the website said it was the oldest one in existence, which I thought was really interesting. So what else about the down wools? Um, they have colored faces and legs. They're usually white. They originated in the Downs or the Dunes of Southeast England. They're a meat sheep. Their, their wool is bouncy and hard wearing. The locks themselves have a very disorganized crimp. They call it a spiral crimp, so it's not a typical wave. Now, unfortunately, I don't have any raw locks to work from. I only have this combed uh, top. And I have a few thoughts on that when I get to my sample and my impressions in the spinning of this particular fiber. Um, it's felt resistant, I can attest to that, uh, because I have a pair of slippers made out of baby doll salt down that I have put through the washing machine and the dryer and they have not felted. Um, Smith advises to spin finer than you think necessary because the uh, yarn tends to expand and fluff up after you wash it, which I found to be the case also. Uh, the fleece weight is four and a half to ten pounds. The staple length is variable, anywhere from two and a half to four inches. Um, because my prep was combed top, which what that means is they send the fibers through these uh, these combs, and it pulls out all the shorter fibers and just leaves all the long fibers. So my sample was definitely on the long side, like I would say four to five inches, which impacted the way I chose to spin which I'll talk about in a minute. Uh, the fiber is chalky, it lacks luck luster. 
Uh, she said it's also good for blending. So let's say you have some alpaca that's about the same staple length. If you blend it with a down wool, you're going to have more, um, more memory and more resilience in the yarn. I have some self down that's blended with Tussa Silk from Ingle Nook Fibers that I'm going to show you. And I think that makes an excellent blend as well because the silk sort of gives more structure to the shorter fibers, I think. I, um, I'm not really sure about that, but in my, in my opinion, the south down with the silk was way easier to spin than just the sharpshire that I was spinning this week. Um, because of the shorter staple that these down breeds tend to have, uh, it is recommended that you work from a carded prep. And so I worked from a combed prep, so um, I spun mostly worsted style rather than woolen, but I think this fiber would be perfect for hand carding on Rolex or drum carding and doing a true woolen spin. Yeah, so I thought that was really, really interesting. I'm learning a lot about uh, all the different kinds of, like when you take a deep dive into a particular family of sheep, you know, you, you learn some things that, you know, you didn't know before. It's pretty cool. All right, so enough talking about that, the breed. So here is my, uh, my square. Now, <laughs> I'm sorry to say I didn't finish my square this week, but I didn't want the lack of finished objects preventing me from recording a podcast. So I hope you forgive me. Um, if in the editing, uh, I'm filming this on Friday the 13th, I'll edit on Saturday and get uploaded Saturday night. If I finish the square before then, uh, I'll go ahead and insert some footage here on what the finished uh, square looked like, but I'll show you what my progress is right now. So here's my, uh, here's my square. Uh, this is the Berlin Blanket by Kate Davies. Uh, it's knit from the center out. And it has this leaf motif that I think you can see forming here. Uh, what I found is that this wool uh, is, is very round in its finished ply. Okay, so this is my, this is what I'm working from, this little ball here. And you can see, I think you can see, here, move over. It's very, very stretchy, very, very elastic. And the fiber has kind of a round, a round quality. I know a lot of people like to spin three ply yarn. I don't spin three ply yarn very often, but if you want that roundness of a three ply and sort of that cush, um, the down breed here I think would be a great uh, yarn a fiber to work with to give you that nice round. Uh, I think it even would, would work good in cables because what I'm seeing here is the stitch definition is quite good. So you can see there's a little stockinette with the leaf motif and then the garter here. So how did I spin this? So I spun this in a uh, worsted style on, my, on one of my drop spindles.
I got this in the mail today. So here's the card, Shropshire Top, and this I saved a little piece of the comb to prep here, and what you can see. Now I don't know if you're noticing this, but this is what I found in the spinning. You see how fly away that is? It, I, I ended up with fibers like all over my black, uh, my black pants. Um, so you can see, kind of get an idea of the staple length, it's, it's about four inches. But you know, the thing about combed, uh, commercial comb top is sometimes I feel like the life's been ironed out of it. You know, it's been so, it's been kind of pushed through these, kind of handled roughly through these combs. And I mean, I don't see any, <laughs> I don't see any crimp in this at all. 
and uh, as I was spinning, I, I it, it kind of would. Um, it was pretty easy to spin actually because the fibers just kind of uh, flew away from one another, which really was a surprise because uh, in my other experience of spinning down wool, I have some baby doll self down that I spun. I found the, the, the roving to be real grabby and you know wanting to stick to each other. And this, not so much. So, yeah. So I, I was having a little trouble spinning consistently so uh, what I did is I, I used my I have some oil and water mixture that I use when I comb wool and I sprayed the top with it and I kind of got it a little oily because I just felt like it was difficult to, to draft and to, to get a consistent yarn and I felt like that kind of helped the spinning but uh, yeah working with this just reminds me of how much I prefer working from from the fleece rather than a commercial preparation. I think you you just don't know what the character of the fiber is really until you wash it. So yeah, so much like my uh, Hill Radnor and Black Welsh Mountain, immediately after skeining up after it was plied, it, it had really basically like kind of a a stiff unbending quality to it. And then after I spun it, it just, like, <laughs> it came back to life. All of its spring, uh, all the characteristics that the books tell me it should be like is, is showing up in the, in the finished yarn. But, but in the roving, I mean, I would never have, have guessed that initially. So... Yeah, I have to say, I've never met a wool I didn't like. Um, I would like to see this in a fleece, though. So I'm going to be on the lookout for for a down wool. I don't think I want to get a whole fleece, but it'd be nice just to have maybe a pound. So if you know anybody who's got down wools, I, you know, give me a line on that. I'd love to pick some up and, and compare it to how the commercial prep was. All right. Oops, let me this back. So this isn't my first experience with down wools. Um, a while back when I first learned how to spin, I, I purchased some baby doll south down and I made this yarn. So now baby doll south down is like a miniature version and they're like super cute. This is the leftovers. And I made these, these mucklucks. And uh, they're pretty worn out now because uh, you know, I've, worn them, I've worn them quite a bit. Um, but what I noticed about them is they have not pilled <laughs> at all, really. I mean, a little bit of wearing, but, but uh, they've, they've pilled very little. And they also have been through the washer and they have not felted. So uh, definitely felt resistant. Uh, the only thing about these is I wore them so much, I wore a hole in the heel, as I think I didn't, um, I didn't seem good enough. So I'm just gonna take my leftovers and reinforce uh, the bottoms of these. But yeah, so this is South Town wool. I, I don't know how Baby Doll South Town compares to the other ones, I mean, every every sheep is different, every breed is different, and then there's variations within the breed. So I think it's important not to make generalizations 
about certain breeds of sheep uh, because I th and I think that if you try a breed and you don't like it you should try it again from a different resource and you your opinion may completely change so there is a lot of variation within within the breeds and then the other thing I have with Southtown is I'm going to pull this out for you when I fir first started spinning my husband I, I am sorry to say this has been in my stash for a really long time. <laughs> sorry for the crinkling. So these two, <laughs> the, these are baby doll south down wool. Now this is, I'm going to show you the card here. Let's see if I've got a little sample of the wool here. I do. Whoops. <laughs> always very bouncy like a bouncing ball so here's the card that I saved so this is my little sheep and it's a little baby doll south down it's so cute so this was kind of what I was expecting uh, with the Shropshire like look at the see if this but this is you can see this is this is carded. Okay, so just a quick recap of carded versus combed. If you've ever had a dog or a cat that you've groomed, you know that when you go to the pet store, you can buy basically two kinds of uh, two kinds of things to comb your your or brush out your animals. Right? There's the, the those slicker brushes, which are like pads with a lot of little tiny pins on it and then there's like rakes and combs right just just like your hair there's brushing and there's combing so when wool is carded all the fiber in various lengths is put through drums with that fine mesh and so it's all basically blended and going in all different directions and so I think you can see that here See yeah, how there's kind of a web of fiber. But look how short this is. This is super short. Like this wool, I want to say it's like two inches, maybe two inches. So I I thought for sure the Shropshire would be very similar, but then I realized it was combed. So only the best and longest fibers remained in, in the in the wool. Oh, the other thing, interesting thing I read about Shropshire is I guess there's a big demand for the fiber in Japan because the wool is used in futons. And I think a lot of batting for quilting is also made out of down wools because it's again, it's real spongy, it's resilient, and it holds its shape. So it would be great for quilt batting, uh, for futon uh, mattress stuffing, I guess. So I thought that was pretty cool. So yeah, so I found this in my stash, and I did spin a small sample of the of the brown here, and I spun it wool. And you have to, I I find that anything less than uh, two and a half inches really must be spun with a woolen style because worsted style would be very tedious, and you know you'd have to do these tiny little draws, and it would take a really long time. So I made this from that fiber. See how you could, woolen yarn is got a lot of, t uh, oftentimes has a lot of texture. But yeah, it's got, also got a lot of life to it. Yeah, so I, I spun this woolen on, uh, and I'm, I'm determined to get through some of my stash. Because I just have way too much a stash, like years old. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm, I'm not getting more time as I get older, right? So I, I'm, I'm really, as I'm doing these breed studies, I'm pulling out related fibers and uh, trying to get a jump on using some of this stuff up. But yeah, so, so yeah, I think this fiber would be great for, yeah, great for socks, great for a sweaters, mittens. Um, also be great for stuffies. So if you were making a stuffed animal, this would be great for stuffing into dolls or like, you know, stuffed animals. But I'm pretty good about when I store stuff, 
I do usually keep the tag and then I also will label with a Sharpie uh, what the fiber is. So, you know, five, ten years later, or when I'm gone, someone at, at the Goodwill will know what it is. <laughs> so, yeah, so what other, uh, what else can I share with you about South Down? So, one last little, little blurb about the Down family. And then we're going to move on to the European short-tailed family next week. So we're going to do North Ronald Z, and I think I'm doing Icelandic, Shetland, and Finn in the next upcoming weeks. So here is another sample I have of South Down. This is South Down in Tussa Silk by Inglenook Fibers. This is, I have a very healthy stash. So this is 65% British South Down and 35% Tussa Silk. And here's my little, I spun a little bit of it up on a uh, spindle. Here it is. Beautiful color. It's claret, it's a wine color. And I'm spinning this up on these spindles here. So these three spindles, I'm, I think Elizabeth Daly calls these Lokis. I'm not 100% sure. If, if I'll find out and I'll put it, uh, put it down below here what, what type of spindle this is. So yeah, so here, Here's a sample of that wool. And I think that, um, yeah, adding that tuss of silk lends a luster to the wool, which doesn't naturally have. It's a, more of a chalky uh, quality. And it's spun quite thin. Yeah. And so, let me pull out a staple here. Let's see. Let's see. So this, see that's about, I would say that's a three and a half inch staple. Yeah. So yeah, I like, I like South Down. I, I definitely look forward to spinning more. I think even if you get farm produced roving or roving from a small mill, you're going to get a more authentic experience than using combed top. I, I don't, don't mean to denigrate combed top, but I have to say it's my least favorite uh, fiber to spin. But that's just me. Yeah. All right, I think I've talked enough about, <laughs> about sheep. I pro yeah, probably put you to sleep. All right. Uh, let's do my hand spun sweater. No, my hand spun mittens next. So if you've tuned in last week, you will have seen an almost completed mitten. So these are my mummer's mitts. out of this book, Saltwater Mittens, which I talked about last week by Christine Legro and Shirley Scott. Uh, I'm knitting it out of this yarn, which is a Romney that I combed and spun up on my Lendrum wheel, which is back here, my double treadle. And then this is some um, Shetland wool. So let's see, let me see if I can separate. So the, the mittens are not without their errors, but who cares, right? They're just gonna be. So I've got this, I think I had this one finished last time. I just have to do the, do the thumb. 
But since then, I have uh, knitted up the left mitten. And this one, I need some concentration to do the to do the decreases and to close. The pattern calls for you to turn the mitten inside out at the end and do a three needle bind off to close up the top, which I forgot to mention last time, I think. And it actually does give a nice, it actually does give you a nice closure to the mitten. Um, I was looking at this the other day and I noticed there was a stitch that had gotten, that was loose. So I had to like, you know, sew it in and stuff. So it's not without its, it's not without its uh, flaws, but that's what makes it charming, right? So yeah, so hopefully I can find some time and put this on my priority list to finish up these mittens. So I'll definitely have these done next time. Famous last words. I am trying to limit my projects because um, if you have just too many irons in the fire, you just, you just really can't get anything done. So I'm trying to focus on, you know, a set number of things. So the breed study and the spindle spinning, um, the samples has taken, uh, I would say it takes um, 25 grams, takes me like four hours maybe in the afternoon to spin um, for uh, the sample. And then of course I've got to apply and then wash and then ball up and then the little squares here that I'm making, um, you know, I can do these in an afternoon. They're getting faster now, um, but I am struggling a little bit with the pinhole cast on. I mean, it's, it's, not, it's not seamless. There's always a little bit of awkward fiddliness at the beginning when I have like eight stitches on four needles. And I'm gonna try spin it up knitting this up on a certain magic loop next time and see if that makes any difference. So yeah, so those are my hand spun mittens and Lopa Pesa update. I'm gonna take a sip of coffee here. So this is my first sweater of this type and I finally oh boy let me see if I can even show this to you it's kind of at an awkward phase now because the the sleeves are attached and I'm working the the yoke which I can't stop knitting it like I didn't even want to record today I just wanted to sit and knit this yoke because <laughs> it really is fun because this construction is fun because you do this bottom part, it's kind of mindless stockinette, and then you get to all the exciting parts at the end. So, so here, I'll show, see if I can show this to you. Let's see, where's the center? Here it is. It's called the Lurif Lurifax Jumper Lopa Pesa. I'll show you a picture. Here's a picture. Lurifax Frost by Trude Benstop. She's the Norwegian Saga online. And uh, yeah, I had a little trouble. <clears throat> it, it, on paper, it seems easy. I would just put the two tubes of the sleeves here and the body here and, you know, but I had to, carefully pick the 10 stitches I wanted for the sleeves where I wanted to where I at the beginning of the round you know where the increases are I wanted that to be down the inside of the arm and then <clears throat> I had a little trouble with the directions it's not the pattern it's my inexperience so but you you put you know x number of stitches from one side of the body on a holder you thread and knit the first sleeve over the same needle and then you put a stitch marker at the first assembly and this will mark the start and end of every round. So I wasn't sure where that's supposed to be. Like as soon as you attach, after you attach. But then when I got to the chart, I'm not gonna give you a, I won't show you the chart, but it has this note here. And the note says, stitches six and seven in chart B is the mid front of the sweater. Count from the center to find out where to start. So yeah, so I had to figure out like where the center is 
And then, Count Barry, I know you guys are laughing, you Norwegians and Finnish people. <laughs> You know, you've knit these sweaters a million times. And uh, one of my viewers said that she's been knitting uh, Lopa Pesa sweaters since she was seven. <laughs> and I'm 62, just doing my first one. But, but yeah, I'm loving it so far. I'm making it out of, um, I'm making it out of this, of course, authentic Icelandic wool. So from the plates of Plutolopi, which I love. I'm already dreaming of my next one. I want to make one of Jennifer Steingass's patterns, the Drama, I think it is. But I don't want to use Let Lopi because I, I'm sorry to say, I go into my storage area of my house to find that South, uh, that baby doll South Town wool. <laughs> and I found three sweaters in progress <laughs> and one of them is oh shoot now I don't remember what it's called it's um, Diana Wall Wallace pattern a fern something oh, it's got trees I'll show it to you next time but this sweater has both sleeves done and the body almost completed and I just tucked it away so it's made out of let lopi. And uh, you know, as I was digging around in there looking for stuff, <laughs> I was getting all hot and sweaty, you know, because I'm, <laughs> I'm digging through like plastic bins and stuff trying to find this, uh, this wool. So I find this sweater and I had a t-shirt on and I put the sleeve on on my bare skin and it was like a Brillo pad. <laughs> it was just, it was so scratchy, the let lopi. And I know, like, oh, it'll soften when you wash it. I'm sure it will. And, you know, if you wear it over a long sleeve shirt, you're going to be fine. But um, I just find this wool in this more, I find this to be so much softer when I, uh, when I put the sleeve on here, even over my bare skin. I mean, it, it just does not have that same Brillo pad effect as the Let Lopi does. So anyway, I digress. So Elizabeth Magnusson says to, to duplicate the gauge of let lopi with a softer alternative, use one strand of plutolopi and one strand of her love story lace, which got me thinking. Now I've seen people strand the uh, plutolopi with a mohair, but I, I kind of, if, if I'm going to do an Icelandic sweater, I want it to be 100% Icelandic wool. You know, I really want it to be authentic. So I'm, I'm, I'm making plans. I'm future imaginary sweaters that I want to make. So I thought you'd get a kick out of all the whips that I found when I was in search of my baby doll south now. And this here on my bed is just a small number of projects that I've started. So, um, yeah, so don't feel bad about having a lot of unfinished objects because uh, here we go. I'm just going to go through a couple of them. So this here is the Felix cardigan. And it's made out of Green Mountain Spinnery. And all it needs is the button band and the collar, and I've done that. So there's one. That one's almost done. This is the Carbeth jumper by Kate Davies. And it's made out of this Dove Stone, beautiful, I think it's a blue face luster. It's kind of a, that mustardy gold color. And I have so, so a good part of the body done there. So there's sweater number two. Sweater number three is the Skogafjell, which I probably didn't say correctly. Uh, this is a jumper by Diana Wall, I think, for Tote Yarn. There's the picture. And I have a sort of low piece here. I have the, the sleeves knit and the body. So I think I'm going to finish this um, this winter. Okay. Uh, this beautiful yarn is Katia Spanish Merino. And it's a super bulky yarn, very soft and springy. 
And this is the candle by Elizabeth Smith called the Abbey Shaw Cardigan. And I had started this. So I've got this underway. Here's sweater number four. And here's another one. Now this one is by Holy Locatelli. I think it's the simple summer sweater. Something like that. Yeah, I've got all my notes and everything. Luckily, I have the, the pattern notes with the bag. And for this one, I'm knitting it out of the called for yarn here. Yellow by Rosa Pomar. I think it's a cotton. Wool and cotton blend. And here's my swatch. And here's the, I got the yoke. I think I was just about to separate for the sleeves. So this is the handful of sweater projects that I have on the go. And then this thing right here, I think this is my oldest whip. This is a pattern by Ann Hansen, and I don't remember the name. I think it's Ariel or Arietta, but I'll, I'll, I'll make sure to look it up and put it in there. It's uh, in, the, in the show notes. Um, this is a lace scarf made out of, and I don't have the tag for this yarn, but I know that it's from Handmade and Fine Yarns, and I think it's a sea cell merino blend. And this I started, oh gosh, I think when I first started knitting. And look how far I've gotten here. It, it's almost done. I mean, I really could just bind it off now. So I'm going to look up the chart my first time working from a chart. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, finish that. I think it'd be really nice for spring. So yeah, so there's just a handful of some of my uh, whips. Um, there's more. Um, but these are the ones that uh, came to the surface uh, as I was going through my stash. So what do you think? What should I finish next, you guys? Leave a comment below. Um, tell me what you think I should finish next. All right. We'll be back in a minute. So, yeah, so that was my Lopi update. Yes. Am I still filming? Yes, I'm still filming. All right. So what did I, I wanted to show you. I got a new spindle in the mail. This one here. This is uh, a spindle from Vermont Spindles, Bill Mutchler. I got this from him. It's mahogany. And I spun all my uh, Shropshire on this spindle. And then I applied on my what did I apply on? I applied on my little gem. I have the lace, super fast lace flyer and the uh, lace whirl on my little gem and it's it's brilliant for plying. It's super quick. It gets a lot of ply twist in your yarn right away with not a lot of treadling. So I'm really a slow treadler. I'm not, you know, I'm not a real speed demon when I treadle, so I like a high whirl. So yeah, so that was a new acquisition. So if you're interested in buying uh, an affordable, well-performing spindle. I highly recommend Bill Bill's shop. I'm not affiliated. I don't get a commission or anything. I'm just a fan, and I like to promote small makers. And, uh, you know, just, uh, it just it makes my soul feel good to uh, support small makers. Plus, I get this spindle. <laughs> Selfish me, I get the spindle out of the deal. So, yeah, so I spun it on this, and... Uh, yeah, you probably saw it in the action earlier when I inserted some spinning video. So I think I'll close today um, and wish you well. I hope you're I hope you're well. I hope you're 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 staying as healthy as possible. Uh, many of my favorite podcasters and and family members have gotten sick recently, and I wish everybody a full recovery. If you're one of those, um, I hope your winter is going well. And I look forward to speaking with you next time. Again, thank you so much for all of your comments. They really touch me deeply. 
And I realized that behind every comment, there's a person who, how can I say this? Every, every one of you has so much value, so much life experience, so much talent, so much grace, so much humor, so much generosity. And I want to just acknowledge that I know you're out there. And uh, yeah, I love you and I, I, I hope you're well. So please do say hello in the comments below. Uh, let me know what you're up to, uh, if you've got any uh, tips, tricks, or resources uh, for me. I'd love to hear it. And I will see you next time. Have a good week. Bye now.